Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. Hey, look at me. I'm the Larax now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Hi, how are we doing? It's been a while. Well, <laughs> oh my gosh. I just have to say I'm a, I'm a little bit slow and I'm a little bit cranky today. Why? Because I just, I just got back from uh, going to the gym for the first time in about three and a half years. Uh, and I feel like absolute crap right now. <laughs> so a uh, little, little, little bit sore. It was it was a arm and chest day for day one, so I can't really move my arms without it hurting. Um, so I'm kind of grumpy. It's like th that that muscle pain, like where it goes beyond feeling good, and it's just this dull throbbing ache. So you know, it's kind of making me a little bit tense. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow will be fun. Yeah, it's just uh, they finally removed all the mask restrictions indoors and in, in public gathering places and on mass transit, and you don't have to wear them at the gym anymore. So it's time to go back to the gym. Uh, unfortunately, I got super fat during COVID. I'm getting no Fedorovsky, not getting ripped, just uh, attempting to get a little bit less fat and down to pre, down to pre uh, pre COVID uh, pre COVID weight. Um, anyway. Wow, today we got a lot of stuff going on here. Obviously, we got Maritime Monday, which is just starting. And if you recall, I was planning on being in a new studio at this point. Well, I mean, not a new studio sounds fancy. I was planning on moving all my crap to another room in the house over the weekend. Well, I did. I did move all my crap. I, I cleared out a room. I moved everything over to the, to the other room in the house. And uh, then I realized that I don't have the, that's like the one room in the house that I didn't have the internet installed when I moved into this place. So, uh, eh. had to move everything back <laughs> here last weekend, back to this room. Uh, internet people are coming to, to connect the internet in that room tomorrow morning. So depending what time I get out of the work, out of work tomorrow and back from the gym, I might be able to scramble everything over there before the show tomorrow. Uh, if not, we'll just kind of have to do it whenever I get time. Weekend of the latest, but I'm going to shoot for tomorrow. Whew. Trying to breathe again. <laughs> um, all right. Now, I was watching some of the comments here. And by the way, welcome, everybody. Welcome to everybody, all the mods, the uh, the Vice Squad. This is our, this is our little uh, Maritime Monday stream we got going, which we do every week. And uh, what we're going to do after this, just so you're all aware... We are going to uh, be starting the ice cream murder trial right after this. We're going to start with opening arguments and uh, we'll, we'll progress each day. We'll do morning session one day, afternoon session the next day. And we'll go through and provide common commentary on it and, my, and, and usual comments. Hopefully have some guests on as we go about this to do this sort of like we do with all the other trials. But it's going, it's going to be delayed. Right now that trial is in jury deliberations. They could have a verdict today. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to keep it spoiler free, but uh, somebody will say something and, you know, everybody will find out what it is. But we'll just rather than waiting to see what the outcome is, I guess by the time we get anywhere near the the verdict, we'll be looking at more as whether the jury arrived at what I think is a proper decision and what you think is a proper decision. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to watch that as long as that's viable. If people watch it and if it's, uh, to be honest, financially uh, worth me staying up till two o'clock in the morning, we'll do it. If uh, if it looks like nobody cares, nobody's interested and it's not worth anybody's time, then we'll all shift back to do something else. But uh, that's kind of what we got planned after this. And Sonny or Chris breaking the first super chat of the evening out. Well, my evening, your morning, afternoon, whatever, wherever it is, whatever you're doing. Uh, did you see the harbor pilot? That power slid into the dock slip and ended up with a DUI in Taiwan. No, I did not see that. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, well, we'll have to put that on the item on the item list of things to search for. And of course, Flux, it would not be a Monday, would not be any day of the week without a Mocha Dick Poon XOXO from Flux. Vacation was awesome. Now back to the old grind. Yep, I started my old grind uh, today. Back of the office. It was it was a nice Monday. Now today we've got to, on this Maritime Monday thing. Like I said, we'll we'll do the we'll do this trial right after this, um, starting at about eleven. I don't know how fast we'll finish this up, but if there, we'll we'll feed everybody over to my other stream. And if uh, you know, hopefully it'll be like fifteen minute break between the two. We'll see how I 
We'll see how I uh, how I manage my time. And as you know, time management isn't one of my isn't one of my big skills because I talk too damn much, like I'm doing now. Now today, what are we what are we talking about? We we are talking about this vessel, this this ship. We the Zeebrugge disaster. Uh, it deals with a a ship with an incredibly long name. The the ship is the Herald of Free Enterprise. Is the name of the ship? It's a car ferry, and uh, things went horrifically wrong as they're as they're wont to do on our maritime monday shows things went things went poorly and that's what we're going to be talking about today the things that went poorly with the ship and this is a recent event this is a 1987 disaster and so i thought we'd we'd start off and just kind of talk about it as we go oh and by the way there's some there's some more good news i guess it's good news is good news to me yeah, the uh, we we had uh, Sam from Brick and Mortar on here, and I said that I was trying to get uh, the the operator of the uh, Maritime Horror site, and uh, we're doing good. We are now in communication, and probably, hopefully, hopefully next week or the week after. So hopefully next Monday or the Monday after that, we'll have him on the show and do an interview with him, and then uh, right around the first part of May, we should have the. The couple that do the uh, retired afloat, where <laughs> to have them on to talk about more about the Franklin expedition that we talked about last week. Last last week, so that's what's looking on the Maritime Monday horizon. But uh, let's start with today. Today we're gonna go through this. Like I said, we have a couple of videos to go through. We have a couple of uh, comments to make. And as always, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, make sure you hit the like and subscribe. We've got 206 concurrent viewers and 99 likes. That's less than less than half of you. And I haven't had time to put up a poll yet. I'll put up some stupid lame thing here during the first part of this. So you can take the poll, but make sure you hit that like button and double check to make sure you're still subscribed. And if you haven't already subscribed, I'd be happy if you did. So where should we start today? I guess, I guess where we should uh, start is where the rest of the world found out about this particular accident. Which would be here. It's now reported that more than 400 people have been rescued from the British car ferry which capsized off the Belgian port of Zeebrugge tonight. The vessel, the Herald of Free Enterprise, had about 540 people aboard, most of them British. The latest information we have from a spokesman for Townsend Torreson, the ferry operators, is that 430 people are safe, though some of those have been hurt. That leaves about 107 people still unaccounted for. The Belgian authorities say five bodies have been found. The Herald of Free Enterprise set sail from mm. Zeebrugge at six o'clock tonight, bound for Dover. There are conflicting reports of what happened next. One account says it hit the harbor wall. Another that it ran onto a sandbank. About a mile out... The now, keep, keep these things in mind as we go through here. Uh, all, all, all the different thoughts... Uh, this, I mean, this, this is what happens. You people speculate about what could possibly have happened for this, and uh, so we, we've got it. It hit the, it hit one of the walls. Uh, it hit a sandbank. What could possibly have caused this ship to to roll over? Ferry rolled onto its side, throwing some people into the water, trapping others in the hull. Belgian, Dutch, French, and British rescue services have been at the scene. They took the 430 survivors off. Divers are now working in the hull, searching for others. Christopher Morris now reports. These were the first of the survivors to be brought ashore at Seabrooker tonight. They'd been pulled from the water by a flotilla of rescue boats. All of them were suffering from the icy cold of the sea, and all of them recounted the horror of what happened when the ferry suddenly capsized. They spoke of panic on board as passengers tried to scramble aboard lifeboats or simply leapt into the sea. There were many children on board. The survivors said other passengers had been trapped below decks when the ferry turned over on its port side. There were 463 passengers mm. on the board, the Herald of Free Enterprise altogether, along with 80 crew members. So far, 350 people have been rescued, plus all the crew. But at least five passengers are dead, and the remaining 107 people are still unaccounted for. The huge international rescue operation will go on throughout the night. 
divers are working inside the hull trying to reach the trapped passengers. Yeah, so this is the this is the thing. This is the unusual thing about this this case. It has a very very high death toll. But the it, it wasn't sunk. It uh, I, it as you'll see later, it was a pro, it was laying on its side approximately halfway in the water. But there's a really really high death toll involved. And that, that's that's one of the interesting things that they, they talk about in the uh, various reports and other things we're going to be watching tonight. And there are clear signs of survivors inside, and there's plenty of air. However, the rescuers are having to enter the stricken vessel through portholes on the starboard side, while the passengers have to try and climb up vertically to reach safety. 45 minutes after the ferry left Zeebrugge Harbour, disaster struck. First reports suggested a collision with the harbour wall about a mile offshore, but it's now believed the ferry may have hit a sandbank, which caused the bow doors to burst open, water gushing into the car deck. The vessel was not on its usual route between Dover and Calais. Instead, it had been switched onto the Dover Zeebrugge run. The Dutch authorities have set up emergency centres in towns and villages along the coast to assist survivors being brought ashore. Hospitals in Bruges have treated almost 100 people so far. And out at sea, the destroyer HMS Glasgow is among more than 30 ships involved in the rescue operation. Also on station is the frigate HMS Diomede. Helicopters are still hovering overhead to winch passengers to safety as they are pulled out from the hull. Among the passengers were between 75 and 100 readers of the Sun newspaper who had joined mm. a one-pound ahead day trip for shopping and sightseeing. Yeah, how would that be? You're you 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 win basically a free vacation. And it ends up uh with you and or your loved ones dead. Uh that's a that kind of makes this thing just like a little bit sadder. I don't I don't know, like ugh, just unfortunate. A large group of people that basically get a win a free trip. Now, six hours after the ferry capsized in the worst ever channel disaster in peacetime, Coast Guard say hope for the missing is fading. Weather conditions at the scene are good, though the sea is freezing cold. British rescue helicopters from Caldrose in Cornwall and Manston and Coltishall on the east coast have been sent to the scene of the disaster. At Manston, they've been returning to refuel. Then they're going on to pick up more divers and equipment to help in the search for survivors. The RAF has sent out an urgent appeal for more thermal images, a type of heat-seeking equipment. The pilot of the latest Sea King helicopter to arrive at Manston spoke to Triona Holden. Um, hopefully they'll be in life rafts, which should make it uh, easier for us. And the life rafts have normally got lights on. Uh, they won't have drifted too far from the ship. Uh, the life rafts are very well equipped, or they should be on a ferry like that, so they should be able to, through the night, it'll be no problem. And lights, particularly at night, show up very well. You can see, expect to see lights from about 500 feet from uh, 10 miles off easily. So we stand a good chance of seeing the lights. The rescue operation at RAF Manston. Our correspondent Stephen Jessel is in Zeebrugge, and he's just sent this report from the scene of the disaster. Okay, so that that was the first indication of what may or may not have gone wrong with this. These reports that the uh, the cargo bay doors may have come open somehow, uh, which led to the sinking. Fifty people are reported to be safe. They were picked up by other craft. An enormous international operation is underway, with divers going down along the hull to seek to rescue those people believed trapped inside. Weather conditions are good. The rescue work will go on throughout the night. Stephen Jessel in Zeebrugge. Well, one of the survivors who was taken to Bruges Hospital was Rosina Summerfield from London. Though still deeply distressed, she gave our reporter James Robbins this account of what happened. All of a sudden there was a crash and the boat fell sideways and it fell sideways and it, we thought that it was going to 
correct itself, but it just fell further and further until it was completely on its side. There's people screaming and shouting, and there was children, and everybody was shouting for help. And then the lights went out of the water, and all you could hear was water, and water came through the, the sides of the sun. And people were floating around, and there was glass, and there is it everywhere, and people floating, and children crying. How did you... Uh, yes, and this is a very accurate description that she gave. This this wasn't, and, and as we'll see in a little bit, this isn't one of these stories where the ship just like slowly, 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 slowly lists and then eventually ends up on its side. This was a sudden and catastrophic event. You managed to get out. We screamed, I was in the corridor, and the water was coming up further. We were climbing up the stairs further and further because they were on the side. And we climbed further and further to get out of the water. And it, we we couldn't smash the window above. If they got any more, we'd have been drowned. And then the rescue people came and about 20 minutes to be sitting there crying. And they smashed the window and pulled us through. Britain's part in the rescue operation is being coordinated from the RAF Southern Rescue Centre in Plymouth. Their main task has been to send Royal Naval divers to the scene. From Plymouth, this report now from John Wormsley. In the RAF Coordination Centre of Mount Wise in Plymouth, the call for all help was acted on immediately. The centre scrambled helicopters from the Royal Naval Air Station at Caldrose in Cornwall and from Broadie in South Wales, Manston in Kent and Coltishall in Norfolk, the furthest some 350 miles away from Zeebrugge. But it was from Plymouth that the main need, experienced divers who could find survivors trapped in the hull, were alerted to join up with waiting aircraft. There are people inside that ship in these water conditions. How long have they got? Well, uh, in the situation that uh, we hope that the survivors are in, which is uh, inside the ship, in, and not immersed in water, they could last rather longer than they could in water alone, where the life expectancy is anything between a quarter of an hour and uh, half an hour. So what can your divers do? Well, we hope that uh, in the fullness of time that uh, they'll be able to get inside the ship and uh, find survivors in air pockets and, and so on inside the ship. But at the present time, the pressure is on us to get people uh, into the uh, disaster scene as quickly as possible so that the divers can assist uh, in the rescue effort that's going on at the moment. And we finish this special bulletin with the latest casualty details available from Townsend Torreson. They say that of the 463 passengers thought to have been on board, 350 have been rescued. And all of the 80 crew members are safe as well. But the company say that at least five people have died. There is one emergency telephone number to call if you think you may have had friends or relatives on board. The number is 0622, that's the code for Maidstone, Oast call a London number that they gave out earlier. And that's the latest news from BBC Television tonight. Radio 2 will, of course, be on the air throughout the night. And at 8.30, BBC One will be back on the air with a special edition of Breakfast Time. For the moment, though, from the BBC Television newsroom. Good night. So those are the, some of the first images, the first news stories that people had of this of this disaster, and you can see how it, it went from you know, hitting a ship, hitting one of the the retaining walls, to the, the ship hitting a sandbar, to you know, the the cargo bay doors being open. There were, and it, it, that always happens in the initial stages of an accident. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of unconfirmed reports, but one thing that is not was not ever exaggerated was the uh, was the death toll that this took and what we're, so what we're gonna do we'll look at a couple of things we'll stop we'll pause it like we normally do but there's two two things i want to watch here and we'll see how we see how it comes out on time whether we can do them both or not but uh, watch a, a short uh, a short documentary from another great amazing channel called fascinating horror it's uh, the, all the links should be down in the description uh, fascinating horror. They did a, a a short, a very short documentary on this, and then there's a longer one. But we have some other stuff to talk to, we'll talk about. So we'll see how we'll see how far we get with this.
Uh, let's let's uh, stop this. Let's just go right here. Let me bring this up, and we will go. But first, let me get a couple of these chats out of the way. There's there's no no super chats here, but we just got a few chats that I thought were interesting. Notes on a phone. Yeah, you, notes on a phone. Uh, emailed me this uh, or tw- tweeted me this uh, the other day. So I'm here, and this is this one is close to me because a friend of a friend was on the Herald. He survived. That's a that's you know that's a close close relationship to this. Uh, Fedorovsky, Seabugger, no, Seabrug, Zebruga, Zebruga, Zebrug, not Seabugger, different, that's different. Uh, and JKD, Buck 76, cargo doors open, no position indicators on them to make sure they're closed. Well, we'll talk about that later. Hold, hold that thought. Don't, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to that point. Hang tight. Uh, AJ Matt says, Fascinating Horror is a great channel. I absolutely agree. And I, I was thrilled that they had this. It, it's short and it's sweet, but it's one of the uh, one of the better videos on, that we can watch in a relatively short period of time. And so, hey, if, if uh, anything from fast, everybody from Fascinating Horror is watching this, hey, don't copyright strike me. I'm doing this because I love you, because you're a great channel and I'm sending people to you. So go down there. The, uh, the, the links are down there for this channel. If you haven't subscribed, Please get there and do it because it's a great channel. And they don't, he doesn't deal just with maritime disasters. Uh, it's all just like horror stuff, horror stories that are interesting. Fascinating Horror is a great, great place. Go check it out. You won't regret it if this is your thing. At around 6.29 p.m. on the 6th of March, 1987, Okay, that's a good place to for our very first pause. The date, 6th March, 1987. In the English Channel, it's cold. The water is freezing cold. So that's one of the one of the contributors. In fact, the major contributors to the death deaths were hypothermia from the, the cold water. Uh so you know, it's not like, okay, the ship's laying on its side, so we're all good. Everybody, you know, just climb out onto the ship. It was laying on its side in absolutely freezing cold water. Uh, and we we have lots of people from that neck of the woods here in chat. I always do. So you just, they can let you know how cold that water is in March. March 6th. It's just barely past February. So... Yeah, keep that in mind when you're hearing these stories. That all of these stories and and things you're going to hear happened in freezing cold water. The MS Herald of Free Enterprise, an eight-deck car and passenger ferry, capsized just moments after leaving the Belgian port of Zeebrugge. There's another. The there's another problem there. In- that's the that's the ship here. So you can see it's almost exactly halfway underwater. That's a good thing and also a bad thing. We'll we'll talk about uh, both the good and the bad as we go through this. But you see, it's, it's almost literally halfway buried, almost perfectly halfway underwater on his side. And as he said, uh, this this happened minutes. I mean, just literally minutes after it left port, which is one of the one of the interesting things about it which will unravel as we as we go along here hey pope rackets touched me long time nosy how you doing five dollars super chat coming in thank you thank you thank you sing it lol somewhere out there beneath the pale moonlight someone's thinking of me and loving me tonight somewhere out there someone's saying a prayer it's the hat man me and fivel rocking it we're we're polish sea captain buddies me and Fivel, me and, and Fivel Mouskowitz. <laughs> uh, thanks, I guess, Pope. <laughs> All right. So there we have, <laughs> there we have the the super chat from you know Fivel Fivel Mouskowitz. Uh, yeah. But th- how quickly this this thing happened? This accident happened is I mean, one of the fascinating and also most horrific things of this accident. And the deaths of 193 passengers and crew. 193 passengers and crew. And that uh, 
the the story that the the news report that all of the crew were alive unfortunately turned out not to be exactly accurate mm. but yeah 193 people died in this seemingly not too bad accident I mean, a ship lays on its side. You know, people are going to get hurt. A few people are going to get killed. But 193 people, as they said, this is the largest peacetime disaster in British history. A naval disaster, maritime disaster. Cold, cold water is a killer. It was the most deadly sinking of a British ship in peacetime in more, more than, than 50, 50 Not years. ever, in more than 50 years, sorry. The Herald of Free Enterprise began active service in 1980, having been designed specifically for the popular ferry route between Dover and Calais. This ship, and the others in its class, were designed to facilitate quick loading and unloading, and to have rapid acceleration. On the day of the incident... Now, th this is a thing, rapid acceleration. Again, this is a big, this is a pretty big ship. It's loaded with cars and people, and they they designed it for for rapid acceleration. The Herald of Free Enterprise was not on her normal route. Instead, she was ferrying between Dover in England and Zeebrugge in Belgium. This caused some problems when loading and unloading passengers and cars. Specifically, the ramp at Zeebrugge could not be raised high enough to reach deck E. Okay, so now we got to explain a little bit about the uh, the layouts of the ship. Right? This this ship, it's an eight deck car ferry and passenger ferry. Um, it it was designed for rapid loading, so you could load two locations at one time. You 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 could load through the ramp, and then you could load through the hull. Um, and the 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 problem with this is. The entire deck structure is open. There's no watertight compartments in this ship. You know, we talked about that with some of the other sinkings that we've mentioned, where if water comes into one section, you can seal it off so the water doesn't get into the other sections. This is just like a giant, large, open, like, parking garage on the water. So the water that gets in stays in. And that is one thing that led significantly to the the uh, capsizing of the ship which we'll talk about so there's no watertight compartments on this and uh how it's designed is that uh, a deck it goes a to h eight decks a deck is where the crew and the radio room is uh and then there's like a half deck between a and b decks which is the wheelhouse the bridge it's where all the equipment is to, to steer the ship and B deck is where the passengers area passenger area are. There's some more crew accommodations and the uh, the galley, the kitchen, and the the dining hall. And C deck is another passenger area and another and another galley, another kitchen. D deck is uh, it's a, a it's inside of E deck. It's like E deck is open and there's like a D deck, which is an area where they suspend the cars inside of E deck. And then E deck is the upper vehicle deck. Deck F is crew accommodations, uh, port and starboard side. G deck is the main vehicle deck. And this, this ship is called a row row. It's R-O-R-O. -O. It stands for roll on, roll off, which means you drive the vehicles on, you drive the vehicles off. They're not lifted by crane or any other method for getting on. So it's a row row vessel. You drive your car on. So you can drive your car onto G deck or they had that this ramp that they're showing here to you raise the ramp up so you could get into uh, E deck. You could drive up to E deck. You could drive into the main deck. And uh, then H deck, that's where the engine rooms, the storage rooms are, and uh, some other passenger accommodations are at the forward end. So that, that's how the ship was structured. And uh, they're trying to roll onto the G deck, but also they wanted to roll on this ramp up onto E deck. But we had a problem with that, as they as they just said. There, where Where is my video so I can here we go. back it up a little bit? This caused some problems when loading and unloading passengers and cars. Well, Kitty says floating parking garage. Well, that's essentially the layout. It's just a, the entire body of the ship is open. The entire inside of the hull where the cars are parked is open. 
It's not like chambers or rooms. So you just drive your car. If you're the first car on, you drive all the way into the back of the ship. Someone else, the next car drives all the way back to the ship and you just park that way. So yeah, that, that's what I mean by like a floating parking garage. You drive in all the way there, you park it, and then you go to your destination and you drive it off. And uh, the the ship, how how big is this ship? That's the... Uh, that's the question. It is seven, seven, seven thousand nine hundred and fifty-one tons. It's one hundred and thirty meters long. One hundred, well, one hundred and thirty-two meters long, twenty-three meters wide. Um, that's kind. Of, that's kind of the basic, the the basic uh, specs for the vessel. So it's a large. It's a ferry. It's a very large ferry. Uh, this is the one of the most busy. This is one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Uh, people try to always get from England and want to get their car to the mainland. And people on the mainland want to get their cars over to England for their vacations and whatnot. So, uh, car ferries tend to run big, I guess, and uh, crowded. So that's that's what I meant by a floating parking garage. You literally just park it in there. You don't go into different sections. Like a lot of ships, you'll see these gigantic uh, Hyundai car carriers. You know, like the ones that uh, you, that uh, bring your cars from from Korea to the states, they'll they'll have different chambers that they load the cars into, so that if one goes, it fills up with water. It doesn't fill the rest of the ship up with water. That wasn't the case here. It's just one giant large. Every every floor was basically just a big giant open area where water could just come in and do whatever it wanted. So. The uh, loading of the vehicles onto G deck was through the watertight doors at the bow and stern. So on both sides, the front and the back of the ship, they have these doors that just kind of open like clamshell open and you drive on. So that's how you got onto to a G deck, which is the main deck, which is right on the water. And uh, E deck and D deck, you had to go through these watertight doors at the bow and it is open portal at the stern up this ramp that they're showing. And you, you could load and unload onto G deck simultaneously using these uh these uh they call them link spans. So that's how that's how they loaded and unloaded these things. But there was a problem with loading the cars onto the E deck. Well, <laughs> uh, where your car gets covered in salt water. If you live on the coast, your your car gets covered in salt water all the time. That's like one thing you have to do here, living like like I do right across the street from the ocean. You're always having to wash the salt off your car especially during like the rainy season. But anyway, we're not here to talk about my car wash. Specifically, the ramp at Zeebrugge could not be raised high enough to reach deck E, the upper vehicle deck. To address this issue, water was pumped into the bow ballast tanks on board the Herald, thus lowering the whole vessel in the water until E deck was low enough for boarding to commence. Okay, this is the beginning of the problem. But it, it, it's not a problem in and of itself. It's a problem because of what happened later. So you, you have, the, you have the, the ship that's up here, and you have, to, you have to load onto this ramp, but the ramp you're trying to load from only goes this high. So you need to be up here where the door is, but you're only here. So you pump the ballast tank full of water, and the ballast tank, that's what stabilizes the ship and helps you raise it or lower it, depending how much water you have in it. So they filled the front, the bow ballast tanks with water, so that would add weight to the ship, and it would pull it down in the water until they could drive the cars on through G-deck. Onto, onto E deck anyway, sorry. Yeah, so it was up here. They fill it full of water. It gets down there. Hey, then you can drive it down. But that also puts the open G deck. It also opens up the the, you know, the main G deck that puts that which is close to the water anyway. That puts it even closer to the water. And before we jump back in, let's get these two super chats out of the way. Thank you so much, everybody. Pope Rackets touched me. I literally waited a week for that. That was the the five all the uh, somewhere out there thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a little drunk. Glad you're a good sport and knew what I was talking about. Oh yeah, it was very subtle. <laughs> The five old Mouskowitz reference was very, very subtle, but bracket touched me. And let's go, Brandon. This video is messed up. You have to board the vessel before you get the load out. Back to the video. So, all right. They do that. They lower the ship in the water using the ballast tank. 
They get all the cars and people onto the ship. All vessel in the water until E-Deck was low enough for boarding to commence. Once all the cars and passengers had been loaded, however, the ballast tanks were not emptied and the ship remained low in the water. Yeah, there you go. Um... This was further exacerbated by something known as the squat effect. When a vessel is in motion, the movement of water beneath the hull creates an area of low pressure and causes the boat to sink slightly lower in the water. This effect is strongest in shallow water or when a boat is moving rapidly. Okay. They, so they, they didn't de-ballast. They didn't raise that ship back up to where it should have been. And then you, you have, you have this effect here. I said, where you know, the, you're going through the waves and whatnot. And they're, they're raised. The, the pressure is going up as the, as the wave swells come in. But when you get in that wave trough, it gets this low pressure system, which kind of sucks the ship down even further. And the faster you go, the further down it, it, it sucks the, the ship into the water. So it's already low. And then if, when, as it accelerates, you know, it, it, it uh, lowers the vessel even further down in the water. Uh, Wesley Curry, don't really uh, mind people talking in chat, but uh, you're, we're, this isn't a proselytizing chat here. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, that's enough, Wesley. No more. Don't make me do it. Don't make me do it, Wesley. We're going, going to implement... Uh, anti-spam operation number one here, which is just simply going to a members-only chat. Uh, hang on. Damn it. Why do you got to do this? I guess this is one of the problems with channel growth. <laughs> I'm going to have to start doing this every stream, I guess, just putting us to start out with on subscribers for, uh, we'll do subscribers for one minute mode. And... I literally just said, don't do it. You did it. Bye. See you, Wesley. Welcome to the blocked list. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> we did. I did just yeet him. Uh, did I say members only? I meant subscribers only. Oh, I meant subscribers only. It's subs we're just subscribers only for one minute now. Thanks to Wesley. Praise Jesus. Uh, he... <laughs> <laughs> he made us go to, to uh, <laughs> shut up, Wesley. Right. Oh, and let's go, Brandon. W welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Clean and Sober crew. Great to have you here. Oh, and speaking of uh, let's go, Brandon, and the, the horrible things he does to me, our Effort Friday is coming up in two weeks. Our, our monthly Effort Friday will be on uh, April 8th or 7th or whatever that Friday is. Um, just to, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Okay, it will be Friday, April 7th will be the Effort Friday for April. So tune in for that. We'll talk more about that uh, a little bit later, but not today. <clears throat> All right, back to this ship. So we got it riding low in the water. It's already riding low in the water because it's full of cars and people. They ballasted it to lower it further for loading purposes. They did. They didn't d ballast so it's still low in the water then we have this effect here that the faster it goes the lower it, it gets basically sucked in under the water so it lowers it even further and flux again mocha dick poon xoxo jesus loves you this i know for the bible tells me so let's rock both of these conditions were true for the herald of free enterprise that day the zebruga harbor was shallow and the boat pulled rapidly away from port in an effort to compensate for a slightly late departure. Now, remember, this ship was designed for a quick acceleration. And when he said it pulled away from port at a higher rate of speed than usual, this was pretty much like an F1 ship. Uh, if you're going to compare it to a car, this would be like an F1 ship. From the time it left the port, it had accelerated to 18.9 knots, which is about 25 miles, 21, 22 miles an hour and about 35 kilometers an hour in 60 seconds, which is ridiculously fast for a ship that size. So it got underway really, really quickly. 
The result of these combined factors was that water at the bow of the ship was able to reach all the way up to G deck. No yes. See, this. Uh, they suck too much and never pumped and dumped. Exactly, Baldo Gagger. That is precisely the problem. Um, but I'm sure we'll all be able to find some more innuendos with what happened next. As you said, this. This effect of the acceleration and and you know which lowers it further in being already ballasted, let the water get up in here to the to G deck, and and this is where the the cars enter into the port. I mean, enter into the vessel from the from the bow. This is the front of the ship, so they enter they they enter in the bow there. And uh, as he says, normally this is not a problem. This is not a problem in and of itself. The problem is what he's going to say in the next sentence. Yep, was able to reach all the way up to G deck. Normally, this would not be an issue, as the doors there would be sealed. However, on this day, the bow doors on G deck were, for some reason, wide open. Yeah, the uh, they they didn't close these doors. They, they never closed the G-Deck doors. And so when the water got up to G-Deck, it poured into the, into the hull. And this is where it becomes a problem that they don't have watertight compartments on this ship. Like I said, it's, uh, what was it, 100 and, what do we say it was? It was 120, what meters long? It was 132 meters long. So that's like a 132 meter little lake they've got in there. And the water goes the entire length of the ship from the bow to the stern. It's not compartmentalized. It's not localized. So not only does it have this gigantic area to pour into, that also with the what we call the free surface effect causes bigger stability problems the, i'm sure all the all the engineers here in in chat are going to freak out when i give my lame explanation of the free surface effect but it's basically like you know you you have something there's a little bit of water in it and as you go through the waves or as the ship naturally has its motion all of the water that's in there starts sloshing to the sides and the more it sloshes to the side the more that causes the ship to list and then the more the ship lists the more the water tends to pool on that side, which causes it to list even more. A. A. Ron says, yes, so they left the G-spot wide open and got it wet. That would be one way of putting it. Um, not the most artful or delicate way, but you're not wrong. And let's go, Brandon says, F YouTube for canceling my memberships. Your ballast tank will be full on April 7th. Penguins are getting taller. Soon they will be taller than humans again. I hope so, because that would be awesome. And Baldo Gagger, they, oh, yeah, you, you, gee, I got to read that one twice. Aren't I thrilled about that? <laughs> oh, yes, Kaiser Pineapple helping out the uh, U.S.-based people. Sorry, I forget to think in feet sometimes. 132 meters is 433 feet. So it's 433 feet of open space where the water can slosh around inside. So sorry to all you engineers for oversimplifying the free surface effect, but it does come into play here. So that's it. That's uh, the first thing. They didn't de-ballast. They're going super fast, and they left the front door open. Water cascaded in, flooding the deck and leaking down to the other decks below. The car decks on the Herald were large, uninterrupted spaces not subdivided by watertight bulkheads. Mm -hmm. That's what we just talked This allowed about. the water to slosh around freely, throwing off the balance of the ferry and causing it to capsize. The incident unfolded with astonishing rapidity. Yeah. The ship left Zeebrugge Harbour at 6.24 p.m. with a crew of 80 and 459 passengers. She began to capsize less than four minutes later. After listing to port almost 30 degrees, she briefly righted herself before listing to port again and capsizing onto her side. The whole event 
took no more than a minute and a half. Yeah, this again, this is the ship here in the water on its side. There you go. So, yeah, that's well, not less than four minutes after leaving port is when it started to list. That was the first time they had any indication that there was a problem with this ship, that it was starting to list was four minutes after leaving the port. But the actual capsizing of the vessel from straight up to this condition here took 90 seconds. That's how fast that was. It took 90 seconds for this thing to be laying on its side, half submerged in ice cold water. So if you happen to be on that half of the ship that's underwater, what are you going to do in 90 seconds? And if you happen to be on this other half of the ship, you tend to fall to the other side of the ship, unless you're in like your room or you know somewhere else. But within 90 seconds, the wall became the floor. That's uh, that, that's kind of the, the structural way of putting it. The wall became the floor in 90 seconds. Let's go. Brandon says, pardon my French, but that's fucking crazy. Right. And uh, you know, like it's, it's uh, even for the engineering types, it's even crazier. So uh, let's go, Brandon. Why am I going to regret reading this? Better than leaving the back door open. Then your boy Brandon is going to pay you a visit. I knew I'd regret reading that. Hey, Aaron. So they left the G spot. Why don't I go? Oh, damn it. You, you, you tricked me into reading that one twice, too. Unhung hero, go home, fairy. You're drunk. Well, it didn't even uh, it didn't even get out of the parking lot, basically. And Isabel Rennie, well, now I hate boats. Yeah, and most people were not in the cabins because this was only four minutes after they left port. You got to think of that too. With it, you know, when you, when a ship leaves port, everybody waves to the people. You know, on this on the on the shore, they wave, they walk around, they mill around, probably go get a drink or something. Um, so there's not a lot of time, and it, there was literally not a four. I don't think you could get to your cabin in four minutes. Uh, so that that's the that's the problem that you have there. Well, and I guess now is the good time to to mention the the secret about today's show. I saw someone, uh, I saw someone mentioning before I started this show. Let me, let me bring myself up here and try not to forget to, to, uh, bring up the video again. Um, but this, the secret for today's show, someone was mentioning before we got off the ground that, uh, they were, they were warning people that, Hey, all this is an interesting story. There's no cannibalism, but the secret is, there's a link to cannibalism in this story. In this brief little story we got here, there is a link to cannibalism. So stand by for unexpected cannibalism. There's a cannibalism reference here. Don't miss it. I, I thought that would we'd, we'd make that a little surprise and spring it on you. Cannibalism coming up soon. During that minute and a half, Contact between water and electrical systems plunged the ship into darkness. Yeah. Floors became walls. Walls became floors. Passenger decks were inundated with water. Many people drowned in those first chaotic minutes, while others died from injuries sustained during falls or when crushed by falling objects. It was a stroke of good fortune that the ship capsized onto a sandbar. Were this not the case, it would have undoubtedly sunk completely into deeper water. And, and see, this this again is also the interesting thing: is it accidentally rolled over on this sandbar, and this what the ship was not where it was supposed to have been. It went off course, I believe, in an effort to uh, to shave some more time off their schedule because they they left. Yeah, they, they left a little bit late, so they wanted to catch up time. So they kind of cut a little bit of a corner. And they mistakenly turned a little bit too far off course. Had they been on course, uh, they probably would have sunk in, as you said, in much deeper water. And 
then the entire ship would have sunk. So it was an absolute fluke that they happened to be here in this right place to where the ship would only half submerge. As it was, the ship came to rest on its side, partly submerged with hundreds of souls trapped hey, Steve. inside. Steve Gosney in the house. Here is an account of the incident from survivor Simon Osborne. I was standing at a duty-free counter when I felt a sudden, violent jolt. A woman behind me in the queue started screaming, and I thought she was overreacting. But seconds later, another, more violent jolt shook the vessel, and then, almost instantaneously, the ship capsized. It mm. happened so very, very quickly. I fell onto my back and slid along the polished wooden decks of the ship's lounge until I landed on the front of the bar which had gone from being vertical to horizontal. In the brief moments before the lights went out, I had a clear view of the horror around me. Everything that wasn't bolted to the decks came crashing down. I recall fruit machines, chairs, tables and waste bins tumbling through the air as the vessel suddenly flipped over. Much worse was the sight of people somersaulting from one side of the ship to the other. One man cried out as he crashed through a glass panel, just feet from where I stood, rooted to the spot, wide-eyed, frozen in fear. A split second later, we were plunged into darkness as the lights failed, and I was instantly swept up by the swirling wave of freezing water. So, I mean, put yourself in this guy's position. Not, not just him, but the, the other 500 people on this ship. They're just going about their business. He's shopping at duty free. Other people are probably walking around the decks. Other people are probably going to look for food. And suddenly within 90 seconds, you go from no worries whatsoever in the world to flipping over on its side. And as he said, he's, you know, he's now laying on the wall, which is the new floor. Meanwhile, fruit machines and chairs and tables and glassware and other crap or you know, bottles and stuff are falling on him. And then in the middle of all of this chaos, the water's rushing in. You're getting pelted with falling machinery. The lights go out. And you're in pitch blackness with the water, freezing cold water, and stuff falling all around, people screaming. If you've, if you've seen the, uh, the Poseidon Adventure with you know, Ernest Borgnine, I haven't seen the, the remake, so I have no idea what that how close that was to the original. But if you've seen the Poseidon Adventure... Uh, people have compared this disaster to the Poseidon adventure, the way the water was was pouring in and what was going on in the vessel at that time. Which had crashed through the ship's doors and windows. I thought I was going to die. Mm. Passengers, like Simon, who survived the initial capsize of the ship, were then stuck within the overturned hull often submerged in freezing cold water. They had no choice but to wait for rescue, something that, for many, was too late in coming. An immediate inquiry was launched into the incident. It found that many different factors contributed to the sinking. Okay, let's see what these factors are. More prominent are. than the fact that the bow doors were open when the ship left port. Well, yeah, I mean, if the, if the bow doors hadn't been left open, none of this would have, would have happened. The ship would have just sailed on its merry way with, with no problems whatsoever. And hey, aren't you guys like happy that when I pulled the video down, I actually remember to bring it back up this time? That uh, notes on a phone said, that's exactly what the kid on the ship said, Jeff Poseidon. Uh, as, as those of you that were here at the beginning said, notes on a phone had a friend of a friend who was on this ship and survived. Yep, the doors were open. The 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 roll on, roll off doors in the bow of the ship were left open, which allowed the water. If they're closed, nothing happens. So of course, that is going to be the the main cause of the accident was leaving the bow doors open. Who was to blame for this terrible lapse? It was the job of the assistant boatswain, a man named Mark Stanley. 
And we'll we'll talk a little bit more in depth about this later. But uh, and, and it would suck to be this guy. This is the guy that left the door open. To close the doors. And the job of the first officer, a man named Leslie Sable, to make sure that they were shut before departure. When the ferry left on its fateful voyage, however, Stanley was asleep in his cabin. Sable left the vicinity of the bow doors to be on deck for departure without ensuring that the bow doors were closed, simply assuming that Stanley would turn up and do his job. The court placed the majority of blame on these men, but also criticized the working culture of the company as a whole. Yeah, so... um. That's uh that's a problem. So what we're looking at here with these with these accidents. Well, he, he, <laughs> you had one job, and actually he had a lot of jobs, and that may have been part of the problem. Because <sighs> we know the doors were left open. It's normal practice. For the uh, for for the assistant boatswain to close the doors before the moorings are dropped. So before you you take those big ass ropes that tie the ship to the dock, before you take those off, the doors are supposed to be closed. However, the assistant boatswain Mark Stanley he had gone to his cabin. He'd, he'd cleaned up the car deck after you know he arrived there, and after the cars arrived there, he cleaned up the car deck. And then he returned to his cabin for a short break. And during that short break, he seems to have fallen asleep. And he remained asleep when the harbor station's call sounded and the ship took off the moorings. So the, the people that are releasing the moorings, I have questions about them. They're not really talked about anywhere. The people that are actually unmooring the ship nobody said um hey guys your uh your front door is open the bow doors are still open you may want to close those I, and I, you know i wonder about that but um anyway they unmoored the ship they took the the, the lashing ropes off and the uh the, sh the ship sailed while he is still asleep let me bring myself up so you can so you can see my handsome damn face while i'm talking about this and as he said, the, the first officer, I uh, was named Leslie Sable. It was his job to stay on the deck and make sure the doors are closed. Basically, he's there and supposed to watch Mark Stanley close the doors. Make sure it's done. Well, guess what he didn't do? Uh, later, when, when they were going through the inquiry about this, the chief officer, the first officer, said that he thought he saw Stanley approaching. He thought he saw Stanley coming. And uh, but he, the problem with this, this all happened after the accident. And the chief officer was kind of seriously injured in the accident. And they so they concluded that his his memory and the evidence that he gave about the accident was was unreliable and, and you couldn't be trusted for accuracy. So what they said, what they determined actually happened. He, he, the chief officer said he thought he saw Stanley approaching, but what they believe actually happened was that uh, they were under pressure to get to the harbor station. On the on the bridge, you know, he had to get to the bridge to get the ship out of there as soon as possible. So he left the G deck with the bow doors open, as he said here, anticipating or expecting that Stanley would come and shut them. Nobody woke Stanley up. Nobody checked the doors. And uh, there was also another person on G deck at that time, another boatswain named uh, Terence Ailing. And the court uh, described his attitude, and he he was believed to have been the last person on the on on G deck. And they asked him, "Well, why?" And and this this here is something that we always talk about on pretty much every disaster. They asked the other boatswain, who was the last person to be believed to be on G deck before the ship sailed, "Why didn't you close the door?" Answers? Uh, what are the answers, people? Take a guess. 
take a guess at what the answer was. Why didn't he close the door before he left? Boom! The first answer is the correct one. Rush to judgment. That is exactly his answer. His answer was, it's not my job. You're all correct. He, except for he was a cannibal. No. Uh, <laughs> you're all correct. Every single one of you. Not my job to close that door. Yeah. But he was particularly heroic uh, during during the rescue work. So the the, the court uh, praised his efforts there in in the in the rescue work. So yeah, that's a that's a problem. Not my job. How many times has that got people in trouble on Maritime Monday shows? Quite a few. Now, of course, as we all know, on a ship, no matter what happens, ultimately the captain is responsible. The captain is responsible for everything that happens on his ship. You know, it's the the old captain goes down with the ship, right? And literally anything that happens on a ship, the captain will ultimately take responsibility. And I mean, I see that all the time in the case. It's just, it's just the way it is because he is responsible for the overall safety of the ship, the overall operation of the ship, the overall administration of everybody on that ship. The buck stops there. So it, it's, it's natural. Anytime there's an accident, whether it be a, a major collision, like you know, two ships running into each other, whether it be a sinking or a capsizing like this, whether it be an oil spill, a large oil spill, whether it be a tiny oil spill. Well, okay. Oil spills are a bad example. That's usually the chief engineer that goes down for that one uh, because he's the guy that's responsible for anything to do with the engines, but uh, you know, accidents, you know, things like that. It always comes back to the captain. It may have been a lowly, you know, or able body seaman, the lowest of the low that didn't do his job. Well, you know, the, whichever officers in charge of that guy didn't do his job and ultimately, the captain didn't make sure that his officers did their jobs in managing the other guys. So whenever there's a criminal a criminal charge resulting from like occupational negligence resulting in damage to a ship or sinking of a ship or an injury, it's usually the captain that gets criminally charged. And I know we've talked a lot about uh, the you know the, these accidents and things that happen here in Korea, but that's almost always the case. The captain will almost always get charged. Because he's the number one guy. And it sucks, but that's one of the risks you take being the captain of a vessel. That when something goes wrong, it's going to fall on your shoulders. Uh, before we jump back into this here, we have Marv White. I'm late. I assume start time was 9 a.m. Eastern. My bad, Captain Vice. Just check, just catch up on what you missed. Let's go, Brandon. What if he likes fish and wanted a close up? Everyone likes to go downtown. Don't lie to me, people. It's free resin upper. Oh, let's go, Brandon. The Brandon Collective walks that thin line. Jiminy the Witch. Jiminy the Witch became a YouTube member. Thank you so much. A member of the Clean and Sober crew. Dang, thank you so much. That is very, very appreciated. Welcome. Glad to have you here. I was going to say something, but uh, I forgot what it was. So, all right. Yeah. Well, getting sued isn't the job of the captain. That's the job of the owners. Uh, getting getting criminally charged and, and uh, fined or put in the hooskow is the captain's job. Let's go. Let's go. Brandon says you always have the, the option of not reading it. Eh, I, I, it's not a challenge to anybody, but I said, I, I don't think there's a super chat I've not been able to read yet because you are all responsible adults and you know where that line is. Um, but yeah. I, <laughs> so anyway, of course, Cap the captain, he assumed, there's that word again, he assumed that the doors had been closed. Since he couldn't see, he's up on the bridge, he's up you know, the, the highest point there in the ship, looking out over everything. He couldn't, he couldn't see that the doors were open 
way at the front of the ship. He couldn't see that they were open, so he assumed they were closed. But from where he was standing, the way the ship was designed, he wouldn't have been able to see whether the doors were open or not. So again, it's like a double assumption. He assumed the doors were open. And um, for those of you that were talking about, well, aren't there any indicator lights? Guess what that ship didn't have? Guess what those types of ships now have? Yeah, they didn't have a your bow door. Your bow doors are wide open indicator light. They do now, but they didn't then. That's uh, yeah, needed a dummy checklist. Pretty much. I mean, that's that's it. It's like the old things we we talk about a lot. Of the old Simpsons thing, like, see, because of me, now they have a warning. Mm hmm. Uh, Edward M. Lockwood, vice. I always thought assumptions were the mother of all f ups. That that's where they usually start, and that's where they started in this place. It's it's frustrating. This is literally the most avoidable accident. Just close the doors. Just, just close the bow doors. Just stay there and make sure who's the guy whose job it is to shut the door actually shows up. Dude whose job it is to shut the doors, don't go to your cabin and go to sleep. And if doors are open, dude doesn't stick around, other dude is asleep, third dude, even if it's not your job, even if you're prohibited for some reason from shutting the doors, you might want to tell somebody that they're still open. Uh, let's continue the story. There was, it reported, a disease of sloppiness and negligence at every level of the corporation's hierarchy. I like how, Seven that, people from I the like how that's phrased. A disease of sloppiness. Sloppiness, half-acidness is a disease. And let's go, Brandon says, yeah, but dumb captains keep you employed. <laughs> True. Can't argue with that. Company were charged with gross negligence, <laughs> sloppiness and negligence at every level of the corporation's hierarchy. Seven people from the ferry company were charged with gross negligence manslaughter and corporate manslaughter. But the case swiftly collapsed when a judge ordered the jury to acquit all concerned. Nobody was punished for actions contributing to the disaster. In the aftermath, many changes were made to similar vessels. These included the addition of indicators on the bridge. You know what? To show when the bow doors were open. Do you, want, do you guys want to see this too? What do you think? Sections. Do you guys want to see it? <laughs> Forgot this time. Y'all want to see it? All right. We'll go back. We'll go back in time. All right. All right. You big babies. I'll show you the video too. Uh, it's not my job to click the video back on. Actually, it kind of is, but you know, it sound it sounded reasonable. <laughs> I almost made it through an entire Maritime Monday without doing that. <sighs> Pastor Flash says, I want cannibalism. Hang tight. Hold tight. We're, we're about 10 or 15 minutes away from cannibalism. Hang on. All right. Hmm. It's not my job. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right, let's go back. I was watching. It was really fascinating. In the aftermath, many changes were made to similar vessels. These included the addition of indicators on the bridge to show when the bow doors were open, watertight ramps fit. Yeah, so there you go. 
now there's now there's those indicators. And some of you are Chris, a member for five months of the Clean and Sober Crew, said, well, yeah, it kind of is your job, just, just saying. Yeah, I know, but that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It's not my job. ...to the bow sections and flaps oh. of the vessels. These included the addition of indicators on the bridge to show when the bow doors were open, watertight ramps fitted to bow sections, and flaps to allow water to escape from vehicle decks in the event of flooding. Regulations were also changed to require a greater minimum distance between the water line and any car deck for all roll-on, roll-off ferries. Yeah, so how how is that? And okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna risk doing this once more. <laughs> it went so well last time, I think I'll do it again. Ugh. All right, so to, to kind of catch us up here on what's going on with the uh with the inquests and the investigations that were that were going on here. Uh, the, this, this public court of inquiry, it was held uh, in 1987, the same year the accident happened. They found that the, there was three main contributing factors to this capsizing. Stanley's failure to close the bow doors and the chief officer's failure to make sure the bow doors were closed. And, uh, you know, numb nuts number three, just not closing the doors. Well, no, well, actually, weirdly, he wasn't uh, considered a cause of the accident. It was the it was the captain. Sorry, it was the captain. Hate to let you down. It was the captain for leaving port without knowing whether or not the bow doors were closed. So when the court determined that the intermediate cause of the captain, the immediate cause of the uh, the the sinking or the the capsizing, was Stanley's failure to close the doors. It was very very critical of the chief officer for not being in a position to pre to prevent the disaster. They were calling his actions the most immediate cause of the capsizing. So there's the immediate cause. And then the most immediate cause is dude wasn't standing there doing his job. And the fact that Stanley was asleep at the time of departure uh, caused them to examine the working practices of the ship owners. And they concluded that the uh, poor, there was poor workmanship. There, uh, there was poor workplace communications and that there's there was a a, a standoffishness there were there was communication problems and a little bit of pushback between the ship operators and the managers on shore and that's where they th that was where they identified this disease of sloppiness and negligence at every level of the corporate hierarchy and uh, there was also these issues related to to breaking of waves high on the bow doors while underway and uh, requests to have these indicators installed on the bridge showing the position of the doors. Uh, those were actually dismissed. They, they eventually were put on the ships, but at that time they they'd showed that they'd said, hey, can we have uh, can we have these indicators? And they said, nah, no, you don't get them. And they said, you don't, they don't they didn't put these wave uh, these wave indicators on because uh you know the the uh, ship's captains would they would just come in like bang on the desk if there was an issue that was really important and they didn't do that they didn't ask hard enough they didn't ask long enough they didn't ask in the proper way and why they didn't have these door indicators to tell you whether the doors are open or not why they didn't have those was because they thought it was stupid and frivolous to spend money on this equipment to indicate whether or not the employees have failed to do their jobs. That's kind of why you have indicators like that, because you just, you really can't assume when you're dealing with tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars on the ship, you have 50, 60 million dollar ships and 500 lives. So yeah, they just thought it was a really stupid idea to put indicators on there telling you whether or not the doors were open. But there was also problems with the design of the ship itself. And there, you, the, un, unlike the other ships that had these uh, subdivided watertight compartments, as we said, this was just, uh, just a big contigu contiguous space where any flooding would flood from the front to the back. And the water gets to slosh around and create this free surface effect, of, you know, making it worse. And so, uh, you know, this issue has been had been identified at least seven years before this accident happened. Uh, there was a couple of other accidents back to the uh, late 70s 
where you know there was problems and, and ships had sunk because there was no watertight compartments in these roll on roll off these row row vessels and you know they, there was this need to adjust the ship's bow trim to use the port facilities i said you know, they had to add the ballast to get the uh, the ship lower in the water so that they could load the cargoes on that was a problem And well, well, lowering the ship wasn't the problem. The problem was the failure to readjust it afterwards. To the, it was the, the problem with deballasting, which they didn't do. Now, interestingly enough, interestingly, interestingly enough, or tragically enough, depending how you look at it. In October 1983, about three and a half years before this accident happened, the Herald of Free Enterprise's sister ship. See, watch where we're going with this. It has a sister ship, which you know it essentially means same, same maker, same design, you know, relatively same time they're built. They're just sister ships. They're built the same. In 83, three and a half years before this, the Herald of Free Enterprise's sister ship, the Pride of Free Enterprise, sailed from Dover to Zeebrugge with the bow doors open. This happened once before with the Pride of Free Enterprise, the sister ship. The exact same thing happened. The ship sailed. No, it gets better. See, uh, Kitty says, dear Lord, let me guess they learned nothing. Oh, no, it gets better. It gets better because not only did the pride of free enterprise sail on the same route with the doors open three and a half years prior to this, the reason the doors were left open on the pride of free enterprise's voyage three and a half years before this accident was the assistant Boatswain fell asleep. You don't get any more identical than that. It sailed with the doors open because the Boatswain, whose job it was to close the door, fell asleep. But, see, they said, well, you know, that ship, that ship didn't sink. They just sailed with the doors open because the Boatswain was asleep. It didn't, it didn't, caused the ship to sink. So leaving the bow doors open to the Herald of Free Enterprise shouldn't have caused it to sink. Well, um, some of the uh, some of the tests they conducted after the accident found that once the ships, once the water started getting onto the, the vehicle deck into, into deck G there, uh, it was likely that the vessel would capsize within 30 minutes. And other tests showed that the lack of the water type subdivisions allowed the water to flow freely and increase the likelihood of capsizing. That's the, that's the free surface effect we're talking about. So, and then they talked about the uh, investigation talked about that squat effect. And when the vessel's underway, the movement under the vessel causes this low pressure, which sinks the vessel further down into the water. And it all, and so that reduced the clearance because you already had it lowered down because of the ballast, and then because they went with a well, they went out very very quickly, that pulled the ship even further down. So the they estimate the clearance between the bottom of the ba of the bow doors that were open and the water line was about one point five to one point nine meters. It was like four four foot eleven and six foot three inches. Like some they, they was like that close to the water. And with the ship traveling at that speed of, of 18 knots or 22 miles an hour, 33 kilometers an hour, the waves that were being created, the, the natural waves of the ocean and then the natural waves, you know, weight created by the ship was enough that the water would pour into the front of the vessel. But if, if they had been traveling slower, uh, they would have probably had time to notice the doors were open before they sank and closed them. 
now we're starting to get into an interesting area. Hang tight. Cannibalism. Cannibalism link coming up soon. Very, very soon. Wait, I'm bringing it up. As for the Herald of Free Enterprise itself, a salvage operation was successful in refloating the ship. The final bodies were removed from the vessel a month after its sinking, and the damaged ship was towed to a shipyard near Zabrugge. The owners attempted to sell her on the basis that she could be repaired and sail again, but unsurprisingly, no buyer was found, and she was eventually sold for scrap to a shipyard in Taiwan. More than a year after the disaster had concluded, the ship arrived at its final destination and was broken down for scrap. The Herald of Free Enterprise is now nothing more than a memory, but the incident which cost so many of its passengers their lives is one that the survivors and the world at large will never forget. Hmm. All right, that's the, the end of the oldie video there. And again, go to Maritime Horror. Uh, not Maritime Horror. Sorry. <laughs> Fascinating Horror. And check that out. Check out the site. The links are down below. And where did this? We, we, had, a, we had a point to make here. Where did we go? Uh, PG Keen says, by the way, I hate to be a picky poop. Boatswain is pronounced Boson. Uh, it, it's been short. I mean, historically it was Boatswain, but then it's been short. It's, it's actually don't even spell it Boatswain anymore. They spell it B-O-S-U-N. Uh, just the way it's pronounced, it's pronounced Boson. Occasionally they'll even uh, shorten it further by putting in apostrophes like B-O-S apostrophe N. Uh, but mainly it's spelled Boson now and pronounced Boson. So Peachy Keen is absolutely correct. Fascinating horror always treats the stories with a ton of respect. Absolutely. Barbie World says, okay, I'm officially addicted. Uh, let's go. Brandon says, someone's thinking about pirate hookers. Speaking of pirate hookers, uh, Jeff Moser said that hat, though, thought I was looking at Rob Halford. Uh, well, I, I, I wish I had Rob Halford's money, but no. Uh, th for those of you that are just joining Maritime Monday, this, this is a... Uh, a Polish sea captain's hat that seems to have some dog hair on it that shows up really well. It's a nice wool, nice wool hat. It's a uh, from Sturkowski, the Polish hat maker who makes these hats for Polish fishing boat captains. And that's what this is. So Sturkowski, you can go to Sturkowski and get your own Rob Halford wannabe hat. So, all right. Uh, th thank you for the super chat. And let's go. Brandon says, yeah, but dumb captains keep you employed, which I've already read. So you get a twofer just because you're the Brandon collective. Even Halford hasn't got cannibal stories. Well, he has been known to eat meat, but that's a different thing. Um, we'll just leave that at that. Uh, <laughs> is, is that wrong to say that Rob Halford eats meat? Um, eats human meat? Anyway, yeah, I, I've decided that's wrong to say. We we sh we're we're not allowed to say Robert Rob Halford eats human meat. Um, so what? I, let's get onto the cannibalism, shall we? <laughs> Two things here. There's the in, there's an in, inquest that was held in October of eighty seven. The coroner's uh, inquest into the capsizing returned verdicts of unlawful killing. Seven people involved in the company were charged with gross negligence manslaughter, and the operating company, uh, which P&O European Ferries, was charged with corporate manslaughter. That's a that's an interesting thing. There, there's there's something similar here in Korea. 
Uh, but it's more like if I if I do something and it, when, and they they it's sort of the uh, the doctor and uh, <laughs> Wolf Wolf and Rob Halford is gay surprise. Uh, yeah. No, nah, I can't possibly be Brandon says what collective the one that you're not part of because you can't possibly be Brandon. Um, yeah. So if, if somebody does uh, is occupationally negligent in a way that injures someone or, or kills someone, then, uh, in Korea, the company itself or the, uh, the director of the representative director, the CEO, whatever you want to call him of the company could be civilly liable. You know, not criminal. The criminally liable is only for you, the person that commits the actual act. But if there's a civil lawsuit, because it, we have in in most jurisdictions like respondeat superior, the superior is responsible for the things that their underlings do. So if it goes to a, a civil case, the the captain can get sued, or you can just sue the the uh, owner of the company because he's the employer of the guy that did it. Um, so anyway, they had corporate manslaughter, but the case collapsed after Mr. Justice Turner directed the verdict, the uh, jury to quit the company and the, the five most senior people, as we just talked about. However, it did set this precedent that corporate manslaughter is an offense known to the laws of England and Wales. So this corporate manslaughter thing and the crime of corporate manslaughter became a thing. Now, what does all of this have to do with cannibalism? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what it has to do with cannibalism. There was one particular person on this ship. And I'm got I'm going to bring this this article up here so that I don't I don't misread it. All right. 1987 where this accident happened, the the Herald of Free Enterprise goes down. But during the, during the accident, as the accident was ongoing, something happened on board that ship, which is very, very interesting, which leads us to discuss cannibalism. Lots of the, like, the ism, the cannibalism. An army corporal and dozens of other passengers were trapped on the sinking ferry. And there was their, their only way out of this area they were trapped in was up this rope ladder. So they have to climb up this rope ladder. And if you've ever climbed up, climbed up a rope ladder, they suck. They're scary as shit. They're dangerous. They flop around a lot and they're just really, really unstable. And if you aren't, if you don't move with confidence, eh, you can get in trouble on a rope ladder. So dude, uh, they, these guys, they need to get out of this space where this rope ladder is. They need to climb the rope, this rope ladder. However, there was a guy on the rope ladder that was just frozen in panic and the water's coming in the water level is rising the freezing water level is rising this guy is is on the ladder but he's too scared to move and he's stuck everybody behind him is going um get your ass up the ladder we don't want to freeze and or drown to death but he still hangs on they yell at him they yell at him repeatedly to move and then the corporal, the army corporal, he ordered the people directly under the guy to pull that man off the ladder. The corporal told him to just throw his ass off the rope. So that's what they did. The, the, the corporal ordered them to th pull that man off the ladder because his immobile, his immobility was seriously jeopardizing the safety of everybody else and those that are trying to climb up the ladder. And uh, so they did so. The guy falls into the water and he drowned and everyone else got out. Everyone else made their escape. 
So the coroner reported that the killing appeared to be a reasonable act of what is known as self-preservation. So the coroner said, yeah, makes sense. Uh, so it was a reasonable act of what is known as self-preservation that also includes, in my judgment, the preservation of other lives. Such killing is not necessarily murder at all. So no criminal charges were brought. There you go. That's a that's interesting, but what does this have to do with cannibalism? Because this raises the question of homicide by necessity. Which is exactly what it it purports to be. It's necessary to commit the killing of another human being. Homicide by necessity, put colloquially, colloquially is... Some people just need killing. Well, how that ties into cannibalism is we need to take a trip back to the Essex. I'm sorry, the Mignonette story. We remember the Mignonette where we had uh, the people that were on a whaling ship and the whaling ship uh, was was broken up and uh, there was the four people got in the lifeboat there was a uh, Mr. Dudley and Mr. Stevens and uh, they decided that in order to save their own lives they had to just kind of murder the 17-year-old cabin boy Richard Parker remember that story and if you haven't seen that story if you haven't seen the story of the the mignonette Go back into my Maritime Monday playlist. That was one of our early cannibalism cases. Um, but yeah, there was this poor little 17-year-old cabin boy that just looked pretty delicious because these guys hadn't had a good meal in a few days. I mean, they literally, if, if I recall correctly, they literally started thinking about killing and eating each other about four days into their, into their journey. Uh, they, they eventually waited about three weeks before they murdered poor little uh, Richard Parker. And uh, if you watch the video, you'll also learn that the the lion, the, the tiger in the movie Secret of Pie was named Richard Parker after this 17-year-old cabin boy that, <laughs> that was murdered. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the, the four-man crew of the Mignonette, uh, they, they, they're cast adrift in their little lifeboat. And after th like 21 days... and. They were, if I recall again, I, I get my cannibalism stories mixed up. If I remember correctly, after they killed an eight dude, they were rescued like four days later. <laughs> so, um, so in order to save their own lives, they decided they had to kill the little 17 year old cabin boy, Richard Parker. Uh, he was, he, he'd sort of kind of become ill and delusional because he was drinking seawater, which just don't do it. So they kill him and uh, they were, they were found guilty. And they were sentenced to death. But the court recommended mercy because, you know, they had been in a tragic situation. But what was, that sort of set the, uh, and this was one thing that they considered when deciding whether or not to charge these guys on the, on the, uh, the ferry. This was one of the cases they considered the Stevens v. I mean the Stevens and Dudley case, or the the Dudley and Stevens case as they as they call it. That you know, because if you recall, that wasn't considered a necessary homicide. That's where they. That's where the law sort of be, became more formalized. That it's okay to eat someone. You know, it, 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 it's okay to eat someone on the high seas if you're starving to death, but and it, it's not okay to help them along in their deaths if there are other avoidable things. And uh, this was just straight up murder of Parker. <laughs> it, it just, uh, they just said, all right, he, he might be gone sometime soon. So uh, yeah, they, they drew lots 
to choose the victim who's going to die. And uh, they, they had this big, intense, intense discussion. And they thought Parker might be in a coma. They weren't quite sure if he was in a coma. And uh, Dudley, he told the others that, you know, it's better that one of us die and we all get to eat uh, and that we should draw the lots. And they said, no, 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 no. And uh, then again, he said, come on, let's let's draw. Let's draw lots. You know, Parker, he's over there. He's probably dying. And, uh, you, know, you know, Dudley says, Stevens, you, you and I, we got families. He's just a kid. He doesn't have anybody. And so they agreed to wait until the morning to decide what to do. Uh, they woke up in the morning and they realized there wasn't anybody there to rescue them. And then they kind of you know, gave each other the signal. Uh, you know, come on, come on. And uh, they killed Parker. So they got to kill Parker. They got to drink his blood. They got meat to eat. And uh, but one of the other guys who hadn't been a party to this earlier discussion claimed uh, to have signaled neither as he said hey, i didn't i didn't signal my assent nor my protest and but dudley always said oh yeah i know he he was in on it with us and uh, that's what they did dudley said a prayer stevens uh held he grabbed the kid by the legs uh and then dudley jammed a pen knife into his jugular vein and took him out <laughs> and that their, their, their defense you know, was just that. It was, it was a necessary killing. We had to do it to survive. Well, that didn't hold water, so to speak, because there were other options they could have explored before they resorted to killing poor little Richard Parker. Uh, there were other options. They could have waited a few more days. They could have just waited for him to die naturally. But they and they didn't. There's other cases you know, where we, you know, we've done other cases where they drew lots, or you know, and there was literally people that were vying to be the one killed. You know, say, like, okay, no, take me. You, you know, you the captain's like, take me. No, 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 no. You know, uh, you know, the others like, no, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. You know. But uh, yeah, this they just grabbed a, a sick dude who thought maybe possibly had been in a coma and killed him. So this wasn't. This was not a necessary homicide. They, they 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 didn't exhaust all of their options before stabbing him in the throat and drinking his blood. But in comparing that to this case, the coroner said, okay, well, there's not much else they could do. This guy is just blocking their way. There are no other ways of escape. There are no other options available to them. So unlike Dudley and Stevens, this was literally the only thing they could have done to protect and preserve their life. So the coroner determined that hauling the guy who was frozen in panic off the ladder and sending him to his death in the frozen water below was a necessary homicide. So that is the surprise link to cannibalism. The coroner and courts were relying on the Dudley v. Stevens mignonette cannibalism case to reach the decision. <laughs> Why didn't they just fish? Well, they probably didn't have fishing poles with them, first of all, uh, even though, ironically, it was a whaling ship. Uh, and, you know, they were hungry. Then, you know, because reasons, because reasons. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> now to wrap this up, I want to bring up this article from the Telegraph, and this is this is where we will we will end our show before we start the ice cream murder trial. Again, we're going to do opening statements for that coming up next. Uh, all right, where are we? The Zeebrug disaster remains a warning to companies who want profit over safety. Now, again, this is something that crops up very, very frequently in our Maritime Monday streams. This idea that to make money, you cut corners. Channel 5's excellent documentary, Why, Why Ships Sink, 
the Zeebrug disaster revisited the accident that killed 193 people. There's the ship. And there's the open bow right there. You can see it in the picture. Britain's worst peacetime shipping disaster since the Titanic occurred on March 6, 1987, claiming the lives of 193 people. Why ships sink, the Zeebrug disaster Channel 5 revisited it in detail. Documentaries about terrible events can feel gratuitous. Why is this being shown, you ask yourself, other than an arbitrary anniversary that has popped up in a TV executive's calendar? But this was an example of exactly how these things should be done. Firstly, it explained with absolute clarity how and why the MS Herald of Free Enterprise sank. This was aided by simple but excellent graphics and narrated by actor Jim Carter. The direct cause of the disaster was human error. The assistant bosun responsible for closing the bow doors on this roll-on, roll-off ferry had fallen asleep in his cabin and slept through the alarming, the alarm telling crew that the ship was sailing. But there were systematic failings, too. With the ferry owners ignoring safety warnings and a judge concluding that the company was infected with the disease of sloppiness. The ship tipped over in just 90 seconds. The ballast tanks in the bow had been pumped full of seawater to lower it down to a level where cars could drive up the ramp. When the water began pouring in through the open doors, it sluiced around the cavernous de car deck under the free surface effect, the, the, which we talked about earlier. The ship's second officer explained it in layman's terms. Imagine carrying a biscuit tin lid full of water, he said. Now, and think how quickly that water would slosh from one side to the other. Now, magnify that 1,000 times, and this is precisely what happened. Uh, seems how we don't normally carry a biscuit tin lid full of water. Compare this to you in your office. You go to the water cooler, or you go to the coffee machine, and you pick up a cup of coffee. You fill the cup of coffee to just below the brim, and you start to walk back to your desk. And the more you walk, the harder it is to keep that coffee inside the cup because it starts sloshing, and the sloshing gets worse and worse and worse. And then it spills on the floor and, uh, you know, you, you get angry. That's kind of, that's a better way of explaining what happened than, than how I did earlier. So yeah, that's a, that's it. And then times that by a thousand. Alongside these explanations were nightmarish testimonies of survivors. They described their ordeals in vivid detail, clamoring up seats to the glass partition, which had once been the cafeteria wall and was now effectively a ceiling, preventing escape. Someone holding a baby above their head to keep them out of the water. Eh. One woman whose friend died that day said that survivors remember the disaster every day and they want others to think of it too. This film will achieve that aim, but it was also a warning to companies not to put profit before safety. So if you want to do this, try to find this. I haven't, I haven't searched for it on, uh, on YouTube or other places, but uh, if you try to find this, why sinks ship the Zeebrug disaster? There we have it. Uh, what do we got here? We got a couple of things here. Da, 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 da. Looks like the Costa Concordia laying on her side, just smaller. Legal Vices, this is better than a horror film. <laughs> Thank you for the stories. Uh, yeah, I said it was, you, get, you get a surprise cannibalism. I didn't want to advertise it as cannibalism because, you know, that wasn't, a, it wasn't the main part of the story. It just had this interesting link to one of the other stories that we had talked about earlier. And John Gordon, thank you so much for the super chat. Fun fact, Parker's brother openly supported his brother's killers because he understood they were in a desperate situation. That is very, very true. That's something we talked about in a little bit of detail. And he actually, uh, he appeared as a witness for the killers. So I, I highly recommend going back and looking at the, at the, the two big cannibalism cases we did before last week. I think this is our fourth or fifth cannibalism related story. Uh, the, the Mignonette and the Essex. The Essex was the, uh, that was, that was the inspiration for the book Moby Dick. So the, the Mignonette and the Essex are two great, great things that we've talked about previously in our Maritime Mondays that you may want to go back and look at, uh, especially if you're into cannibalism. Uh, <laughs> Billy, Billy Aoki. That sign can't stop me because I can't read. True words have never been said. So, all right, let me uh, arrange this so that we all get uh, fit. Oh, let's see here. 
I need to customize this stream so it will feed directly into my next stream coming up in 10 minutes. So I'll take a quick 10 minute break here and then we will start the uh, the ice cream double murder trial. Well, that's not, it's not actually a double murder trial. It's a, it's a lot more than that. We'll, we'll talk about it. But we'll start that in just a minute here. I'm figuring out my redirect. I'm saving my redirect. All right. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much for joining me for yet another Maritime Monday. We've got 584 people here right now and 504 likes. So I appreciate that. Please make sure you hit the like button on your way out. Let's see how our poll turned out for today. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button, I'd love you to hit the subscribe button. Because as always happens, we finished the Zachariah Anderson trial. And hopefully in the next week or two, we're going to have some updates and some, some more discussions about uh, what's going on in that trial. Uh, but after every trial, there's a big dip because people subscribe so they get notifications about the trial they like. And then that trial's over and they leave. And we lost about 25 subscribers over the weekend, which isn't much. But hey, 25 new ones would be awesome. The, all right, to end this poll here, um, I saw, again, this, you, those of you that were here at the beginning, you saw me put this stupid poll together on the fly as we were, as we were going, so it's not all that great. Uh, I sunk that like and subscribe button like the Titanic, like a Russian submarine, like a pirate's treasure, or like my hopes trying to make a good poll. And of these, of course, the winning vote, if you'll call it that, was 30% of you said, I sunk that like and subscribe button like my hopes of trying to make a good poll. I admit, wasn't the greatest poll ever. I don't have one lined up for the for the uh, ice cream man trial either. Uh, we currently have gained zero subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed, if, you're one, if any of you 560 folks have not been a subscriber to my channel before, I would be honored if you would do me the pleasure and privilege of subscribing to the channel with that thank you mods thank you for being here thank you chat as always for being here for yet another maritime monday join next week when uh, we could have a special guest or that'll happen two weeks from now but uh, we're, we'll when we have our special guest we'll have a special topic for our special guest and thank you for the generosity shown with the super chats as always not required always graciously and gratefully accepted Thank you all. We'll see you over on the flip side. You should get redirected to the upcoming trial. And I will see you there in about eight minutes. And Steve Gosney says, love Maritime Monday. I don't know how your schedule is or how you're feeling, Steve, but uh, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll be sending Steve Gosney a link here. Uh, ice cream rerun already. It's not a rerun for me. It's a run for me. Yes, my poll is very disappointed. <laughs> so take care, everybody. We'll catch you in about five minutes. And see you there. Thanks for joining. Bye now.